We're talking tonight about what happens when you talk to yourself. And I think that we need to understand from the beginning that we all talk to ourselves. Are you aware of talking to yourself? A few years ago, they used to say, if you talk with yourself, that is, um, that is a symptom of psychosis. So they used to treat people for talking to themselves, and then they found that everyone does. So it's not a psychosis at all. It, it actually is the way we think. If you think, you are talking to yourself. And the interesting thing about talking to yourself is that that takes two. <laughs> have you thought of that? I mean, the, the conversation that you have inside yourself is not a unilogue, it's a dialogue. There are two parts of yourself that are talking, and you have a conversation, and you argue with yourself, and you, you think points, and you look at the other side of a point, and you make decisions by communicating with yourself. And these parts of yourself that communicate have uh, specific uh, personalities or nature. And so I'd like to talk about what those, what those parts of yourself are so that you can get in touch with them and see how they relate with one another. Generally, we think that <coughs> when you are born, when you're just an infant, when, when you first came into life, there was a you that is your inherent self. That's who you really are. And this real you entered your life as a child, helpless, and, um, well, maybe not so helpless. Were you helpless when you came into life, do you think? You don't think. I think so. <laughs> you think you were helpless? Yes. You know, I've come to think maybe we're not so helpless when we are born into this world because when you come into life, you're sort of like a little emperor, uh, maybe a tyrant. All of the adults in your life are servants. That's your first relationship with the world. You come in and you think, I'm the center of the universe and everything that I see and everything that I feel is there for me and particularly the big people, they are there to do whatever I demand that they do. So you learn very early how to make demands, even before you can talk. You can scream and you can kick and you turn red in the face and if they don't answer immediately, then you get a little more uh, expressive even though you don't have words, and you know that they are supposed to respond immediately to you. So that's your first relationship with the world. You're the center of the universe, and everyone else is an extension of you. In fact, probably, I think maybe you didn't think that your mother was someone else. You thought that she was an extension of yourself. And that's interesting because your mother thought that you were an extension of her. So you have a little bit of conflict, maybe, even from the beginning, from the first day of your life. You are the center of the universe. All adults are your servants, and everything is there for you. And then as you grow a little bit, you begin to get a different impression of what the world is about, because the big people get tired of being your servant, and they begin to tell you that you are responsible for yourself. So. All that you have learned early begins to change and you have some new values that are imposed upon you and you develop an inherent self who is who you really are and that inherent you wants everything. I mean that little child in you wants to have everything and do everything and experience everything very adventurous until the time comes when the adults tell you, you're not supposed to want everything, you're not supposed to do everything, you are supposed to behave yourself. And so you take the inherent self that was really you, and you put that aside, and you develop an imposed self, which is like a parent. And then this parent self, the self that is supposed to make you behave yourself, 
takes on your parents' voices. And what I wonder if you have noticed, maybe recently in your life, in your adult life, when you have done something that you feel embarrassed about, and you hear a voice inside, have you noticed the sound of the voice? I mean, does it have a particular sound? Does it sound like someone that you know? Mm-hmm. Who does it sound like? Daddy or Mommy. Okay. <laughs> That sound may sound like the voice of your mother. Very often does. And that's a revealing thing because you find out that your parents don't really leave. Even if you leave them and you're many miles distant from them, you're still carrying your parents with you on your back. And they're still talking to you. And they're still relating to you as they did when you were a child. And if they scolded you and punished you, then this adult self that you carry with you, this inner voice, is also scolding and punishing. And so what happens maybe is this little child in you is experiencing a day when everything is wonderful outside, a particularly beautiful day, and you're walking down the sidewalk and there's nobody else to be seen. You're all alone and you're walking along very happy and you begin to hum a little tune to yourself. Have you experienced this? Mm -hmm. You begin to hum a little tune, and then as you feel perhaps a little more joyous, you begin to sing aloud like you do when you're taking a shower. Do you sing in the shower? <laughs> <laughs> and when you're singing in the shower, you really sing. I mean, you know, there's a whole big stage out there, and you're on stage, and you can be as expressive as you want to be in the shower. But here you are walking down the street and you realize there's no one around so pretty soon your little humming turns into singing and your arms are going you know you're really being expressive and sound is coming out and you're singing at the top of your voice and then someone comes around the corner <laughs> and then what happens <clears throat> you become very silent and maybe maybe if you're very proper you might even look around as if you wonder who that one of them was singing, you know. You pretend that wasn't me. Where was that sound coming from? <clears throat> and this is that parent self. In fact, you can even be walking along a sidewalk and maybe there's a little uh, crack in the sidewalk and you stumble and someone notices and there's a voice inside your head that says, stupid. That ever happened to you? Uh, calling yourself names. As you begin to become aware of the inner dialogue, what you are saying to yourself about yourself, about your future, if you become aware of the inner conversation, then you can begin to grow deliberately. And what that is called, when you become aware of your inner conversation and you start participating in that consciously, that's called waking up. And waking up is an important thing to happen in a person's life because, you see, we live in a world of what I call average humans. You know about average humans? No, what do you mean? <laughs> well, average humans are average. <laughs> <laughs> there are about five and a half billion of them in the world today. And average humans have some things that we know about them from research statistics. We know these things, for example, the average human talks to himself and the content of his inner conversation, 75% to 90% of that inner conversation is negative, self-critical, counterproductive, makes him weaker, causes him not to believe in himself and his future and his ability to succeed. Now I'd like to get those numbers, 75% to 90% of the average human's conversation is negative, critical, counterproductive, scolding. And it works against his own best interest. 
the average human responds to that inner conversation by learning to not believe in himself, by putting limitations around him, and becoming less strong. Now that's only part of what happens for the average human. There's some other things that we know about the average human. The average human has a poor memory, especially for names. They have a hard time remembering people's <laughs> names. And um, the average human talks about specific things when he talks to himself. It's sort of predictive, predictable what that inner conversation is going to be. Do you know what average humans talk about when they talk to themselves? I don't suppose you would know because you're not average or you wouldn't be here. <laughs> but I can tell you what average humans talk to themselves about. They talk to themselves about themselves and about their future and about their past and about other people and their relationships with other people. There is one thing that they don't talk about. Did you hear what I left out? There's the past, there's the future, there's self, other people, relationships with other people, and what's left out? Now. now. The present. People don't talk to themselves about the present, what's going on right now. And that's typical of the average human. The present is left out of the conversation. And because of that, they try to live in the past uh, in, in one of two ways. Either they live in the past because they accomplished something in the past, and so if they accomplished something in the past, they, they did something that they're proud of, then they talk to themselves about that. When I did so-and-so, when I wrote my book, when I had this success, I was. And they're trying to be alive in the past, which makes them not very alive right now. And then there are other people who talk to themselves about their future. And that conversation is like, when I get married, when I get a job, when I finish my education, when I buy my new home or my new car or whatever, they're postponing life. They're going to be alive in the future. So some people are trying to be alive in the past and some people are trying to be alive in the future but they're not alive right now. And even when people are in a pleasant situation in life, I mean, we're in sort of nice company right now, don't you think? <laughs> but you can be in this pleasant situation with wonderful people, and you can be thinking about problems that you have at home problems with finance, problems with health, problems with other people, whatever it is, and you can use all of these things that are not going on in this room to keep you from enjoying what is going on in this room. And then your mind goes into, if it weren't for that, I would be happy. If it weren't for this, I could be happy. If it weren't for, so we find excuses to not be alive and not be happy and not experience the moment in which we are alive now. And someday we realize perhaps we work for 20, 30, 40 years to make a living. And then we realize that we were so busy making a living that we never made a life. And when we finish making a living, it's too late to make a life. And so maybe we think, next time I'm not going to do that. I wonder what you thought before you incarnated in this lifetime. I mean, do you remember, do you remember saying to the Lords of Karma before you were born, do you remember saying, this time when I get here, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to bother with this. I'm not going to spend my time with this. Just give me another chance. This time I'm going to live for now. I'm going to make it work. Do you remember saying that? <laughs> what we need to know is the content of our self-talk conversation will determine a lot of things 
that we should know about. It will determine our future. It will determine our prosperity. It will determine our health. It will determine our relationships with other people. It will determine how we feel about ourselves. Now, all of those things, it would seem, are the most important things in life. Our health is important. Our relationships with others is important. Our prosperity is important. Accomplishing what we came into this lifetime to do is important. And I think it's also important to be happy. All of those things are things that we can affect by the conversation that we have with ourselves, what we talk to ourselves about. But there is a problem. We can sabotage all of these things with our self-talk conversation. And if we are doing that, we need to know it. The worst thing about this self-talk that we are all involved in is you can't stop doing what you don't know you're doing. Now there's one thing I haven't told you yet about the average human. The average human does not know the content of their self-talk. Do you find that interesting? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask the average human, what do you tell yourself about yourself? What is your opinion of yourself? Most people can't tell you. They don't know what they, they don't know what they call themselves. They don't know what they say to themselves about themselves and their value. People who have self-confidence, people who feel attractive, successful, confident, capable, talented, these people know what they're talking to themselves about. And they can tell you. I talk to myself about my talent, uh, about my opportunities, this is what I talk to myself about. But the average human does not know the content of their self-talk conversation. And because they don't know what they're telling themselves, they can't stop telling themselves things that sabotage their own worth <coughs> and their own ability to succeed or their relationship with the future. The average human does not know what he tells himself about money. Do you know what you tell yourself about money? Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you tell yourself that you shouldn't want it? <laughs> if you don't, you're unusual. Especially people in spiritual circles. When people start being spiritual, they start telling themselves, I don't really want money. I mean, I only have to have it to survive. And I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to ask for too much. Um, I don't really want to be wealthy. That's not the point. I want to do what I'm supposed to do and have just enough to be comfortable and survive. And if they think about money very much, they feel guilty about wanting it. Do you experience that? Are you getting tired of me asking you what you think? <laughs> Am I getting too personal? <coughs> well, you know, sometimes people really don't want to, to confront their inner conversation. But we need to know what we tell ourselves because everything in life, everything that we experience comes out of this inner conversation, this self-talk conversation. And it's a conversation between a child and an adult. You need to know that inside you, there is a little child and little children are vulnerable. Little children love to love and they love to be loved. And little children are easily hurt. And because the little child in you wants everybody to love him or her, that little child in you is protected when you pretend that that little child is not there. So we do some things to protect the inner child. One of the things that we do is we wear the look. 
Do you know about the look? The look? What look? The look? <laughs> well, the look. She said what look? It's, it's called the responsible, mature, adult look. You know about the responsible, mature, concerned, adult look? <laughs> it looks worried. That's how it looks. But you're required to wear it if you're an adult. It's a requirement. <coughs> now, that's a little bit less true in Holland than it is in most countries. You can get away with it in Holland a little bit. But when you walk down the street and you see all these people coming past you wearing the look, <laughs> they pass by and you think they're perfectly normal. <laughs> But if one person comes down the street and they are ridiculously, serenely happy, I mean, really look like they're laughing from inside, this wonderful smile on their face, and they're just really having a good time going down the street, people turn around and look and say, what's wrong with him? What, what's wrong with him? He's, he's happy. <laughs> And, th and this is a funny thing, because if you leave here tonight, after our being together, and you're not wearing the look <laughs> when you go home, then people in your family are going to say, what are you smiling about? <laughs> <coughs> or they're going to say, what's so funny? <laughs> and you know, this is what's serious about it. You better have an answer. If you can tell them, I just heard a wonderful joke, then you have an excuse for not wearing the look. <laughs> but if you're not going to wear the look, you have to have an excuse. Now, most people will assume that you are on something. You know what that means. Alcohol, drugs, pot. If you're not wearing the look, you must be taking something. Because it's not normal. I mean, normal people worry. <laughs> Did you know that responsible parents are supposed to worry? <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> I mean, you say, of course I worry. I mean, I, I love, love them. <laughs> <laughs> I worry because I love them. Do you know what worry is? Well, maybe I should ask you first, do you know what meditation is? No. No? You don't know what meditation is? <laughs> no? <laughs> well, let me tell you what worry is first, and then I'll tell you what meditation is. Worry is negative meditation. And um, meditation is a spiritual experience. Meditation is a spiritual experience which is an expression of faith. And all people have faith. I mean, even people who call themselves atheists have faith. And we all are very religious people, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, not everybody wants to admit that, I know. I, I'm not going to hold you responsible for anything. So if you nod your head or, you know, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you. I know you're all religious. <laughs> you see, there's a universal religion, a universal God, and this universal God that five and a half billion people worship has a very specific liturgy. And people practice this liturgy every day, the people who participate in this universal religion. They have a lot of faith in their religion. 
And their faith is so strong that it produces interesting results and predictable results. And in fact, the people who practice this universal religion, almost all of them are prophets. <laughs> and their prophecies are very accurate. So they're very good prophets, very good prophets, very devout people. As a matter of fact, the people who practice this universal religion practice it at least three times a day, every day, all of their life. Do you know any people who are that devout? They practice their religion three times a day, every day, all their life? I mean, that's real devotion, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, these people really believe in their religion. And their religion has a meditative practice. It's a very effective form of meditation. Because the things that they meditate about are creative. They use creative imagery and creative visualization, and they create the things that they meditate upon with their imagery and their visualization. And they experience prophecy, and they prophesy things, and those things come to pass. The uh, universal God, well, his name is evil. And um, his liturgy, the meditative ritual that I was talking about, is called worry. And the faith that I was talking about, it's faith in evil. And faith in evil is called fear. Let's, let's back up and do that again. Fear is faith in evil. Is that true? Yeah. Am I wrong? Fear is faith in evil. And worry is a negative meditation in which people fantasize terrible things come to happen to them. And after they do their meditative practice called worry, then they make prophecies. And the prophecies come true in their lives. So it's all a very effective form of religion, and very devout people do this every day. People worry every day. And they are taught that it's wise to do so. I mean, it is wise to fear some things, isn't it? I mean, if you don't fear anything, wouldn't you put yourself in a lot of danger? <laughs> if you think about all of this, you might have to retrain your thinking because a lot of you would have to stop doing a lot of the things that you're doing if you really think about it, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Fear is faith in evil, and it consists of a fantasy. The fantasy that is called fear is a practice of worry, which is a meditative practice based on faith in evil. And so every time you worry, you are going through a religious ritual on your knees at the altar of a god called fear. And if you simply reverse that entire process, you would reverse the effect in your life. What are the effects? Maybe we should look at that for a moment. Uh, or maybe we should do something else first. Some of you tell me that you have a problem meditating. I know a lot of people who have taken a lot of classes in meditation, and they try really hard to meditate. Isn't that interesting? You know what happens when you try real hard to meditate? <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, meditation is, is exactly the opposite of trying real hard, isn't it? 
So you defeat yourself from the beginning. Well, anyway, people ask me, how can I meditate? I have tried everything. I've tried mantra meditation. I've tried visualization. I've tried every form of meditation that comes along. I just can't do it. So I ask them, can you worry? <laughs> And they say, well, yes, of course, I can worry. <laughs> oh, all right then. You know, you don't need a class at all. All you have to do is worry backwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's all there is to meditation. You just worry backwards. I mean, you can worry yourself to death about your health. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> You can worry yourself to death about your health. Or if you turn that around backwards, what you would do is worry yourself to life about feeling so good that you won't know what to do with the energy. If you can worry yourself to death, you can meditate yourself to life. Because meditation is worrying backwards. You take the process of, met, of worry and you turn it around exactly backwards and apply it the other direction and you will get exactly the opposite result. What is the result of worry? Do you know that? Peace. Let me give you some, you know, <clears throat> what we used to do when we talked about religion and spiritual things is we, we used to have to depend upon belief and superstition. And that's what people thought we were talking about when we talked about spiritual things, belief and superstition. We are living at a time, you and I are living in a generation when science and religion are beginning to meet one another head on. Because now we can prove some of the things that people used to write about and say, people like Rudolf Steiner and people like uh, Madame Blavatsky and and back before that, I mean, there was Jesus and there was Buddha and there was Moses and... All of these people told us some things that if we believe them, if we put them to practice, make a difference in our lives. Now, we have science to tell us the same thing. So let's look at this from a scientific point of view. What we know now that we didn't know 40 years ago <coughs> is that you can't think without moving muscles. Did you know that? You can't think without moving muscles. Most people don't know that yet, but it's true. What they did was they, they took tiny little electrical receivers and they put them all over the body so that if a muscle contracted, this little instrument would pick up the muscular movement. And then they discovered every time a person thinks a thought, they move a muscle in their body. Now, there are no muscles up here inside the head. The brain is incapable of the slightest movement. And yet, every time you think, you move a muscle. And you probably should know this, too. This is something else that most people don't know. The muscles that you move when you think are specific muscles. Meaning this, if your thoughts are fear thoughts, if you're thinking, and you're thinking fear, there's a specific set of muscles that will move. They are the muscles in the side of your neck and across the top of your shoulders. And what happens is when you think a fear thought, your shoulders go up. You notice that? Think a fear thought. <laughs> your shoulders will go up. Um, well, let me suggest you think about something else. Do you have a favorite authority figure that really intimidates you? <laughs> Is there somebody in your life that's an authority figure? You don't have a problem with authority figures. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Okay. Let me tell you, when you think resistance against an authority figure, what muscles do you suppose there are that move? Do you know? Forehead? In the jaws? Forehead? Mm. The muscles that move the most 
when you think resistance to authority are the muscles under your arms, right here. Your arms go in tight to your side, and you start thinking, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> do you recognize the posture? You can see it in the body language. You, you can see what I'm saying. I'm not going to do it. You can see it in the arms, right? So when you have this kind of resistance, you're steeling yourself against something, it goes right there. Watch your children if you want to know. You know, tell your children to do something they don't want to do. <laughs> and watch their armpits and you'll know whether they're going to do it or not. <laughs> if their armpit goes in and these muscles tighten up, they're going to find a way to sabotage you. You know, children may do what you tell them to do, but they will make you sorry. <laughs> children are clever. I mean... Parents ought to know that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wise to find out that your children are wise. They know exactly what they're doing, and they know exactly where your buttons are, and they know exactly how to get back at you when you get there. You do know that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> children are clever. Okay. Guilt. Where, where do you put your guilt? feeling in my tummy. In your tummy? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes in the tummy, most often in the groin. Right here is where people store guilt thoughts. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you about this is because specific thoughts move specific sets of muscles and if the thought that you think is a stressful thought at all, has any stress in it, the muscular movement associated with stress is contraction. Now the muscular movement associated with laughter is exactly the opposite. It's release. But stress thoughts contract muscles. And if you think a thought of stress, you contract a muscle, and un unless that stress thought is followed by a joyous release, that muscle stays contracted. <clears throat> so what that means is that there are muscles all over your body from head to toe that have been contracted in moments of stress and unless you had a real good session of laughter after the stress, those muscles are still contracted now. Well, of course, you slept last night, didn't you? <laughs> so you assume that last night when you went to sleep, your muscles relaxed. And so the stress was gone and you got up this morning feeling totally relaxed, starting a new day with a lot of joy. Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess not. <laughs> Do you know, the truth is that you probably have not been totally profoundly relaxed since you were three months old. Now what you should know about that is this. When a muscle contracts anywhere in your body, from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, there are muscles all over. You know about the big ones. You, you know about, you know there's a muscle there, and you know there's a muscle there, and there's one there, and you know some of the musculature of the body, but do you know that there are muscles all over your scalp? And that when you start thinking stress thoughts, the, these muscles all over your scalp begin to contract. <clears throat> and as they begin to contract, your scalp begins to become a little tight. And then down the back of your neck, the muscles there start to contract a little bit more. And when they get really contracted, then there are little, um, <clears throat> well, not little, big muscles right across here that begin to stand out. And you can actually see them and feel them. They got like rocks. And when they start to get hard like rocks, then your head starts to hurt. I mean, really hurt, extremely painful. And pain goes down across your shoulders and you get something called migraine. And 
the migraine is not really the spasm of the muscle. A muscle spasm hurts by itself. But what happens with migraine is when these muscles begin to contract, they start to contract around your circulatory system. And so the muscles are contracting or squeezing your blood circulation. So the blood circulation to your body changes because of muscular contractions. Now, every organ, every gland in your body has a blood supply. And it has an electrical circulation as well. So there is something called biomagnetic electrical fluid circulation necessary to every muscle and every gland in your body. So as you think stress thoughts and muscles tighten up, they restrict the circulation that go to various different organs and glands of your body. And when a, a gland is deprived of its circulation, either blood circulation or electrical circulation, it begins to age at an unusually rapid rate. In other words, it starts to break down and fail. So they've learned only recently, when they do autopsies on bodies, they learn that there may be one organ in a body that seems to be 90 years old, and another organ in the same body that may appear to be 20 or 21 years old. And so they began to ask questions. Why does this organ age so fast and this one stays so young? And so as they began to ask those questions, they followed the circulatory pattern that goes to that organ, and they found that the organs that deteriorated so fast that they caused the death of the individual, those organs had restricted blood circulation supply and electrical circulation supply. In other words, vessels and nerves were pinched and could not get life force to that gland or that organ. Now, that changes our whole image of what causes disease and death. If you begin to think about it, the organs of your body that are deprived of circulation, either liquid circulation, fluid circulation, that is blood and lymph and those things, or if they are deprived of electrical circulation, they're going to die. Now, we have thought until very recently that the cause of disease is something called germs, bacteria, tiny little organisms, but now we find out that right now, as we're sitting here talking, you've got enough germs in your mouth to kill all of us. So if germs are the problem with disease, we're in trouble. But if, on the other hand, what happens in disease is that our resistance to bacteria is broken down because of a restricted supply of circulation, electrical or fluid, then we produce an organ or a gland that is deteriorating, and it is unusually susceptible to things like virus, bacteria, or what they call carcinogens. Did you know that there are enough carcinogens in this room to kill us all? So if carcinogens cause cancer, we're in trouble. But fortunately, carcinogens don't cause cancer and germs don't cause disease. What causes both of them is self-talk. If we find out soon enough that what we tell ourselves about ourselves is what controls the strength of the body and even the age of the body, the rate at which you age is determined by what you tell yourself about yourself. And you can make yourself more beautiful you can make yourself younger, you can make yourself stronger, you can make yourself more prosperous, you can make yourself more appealing, you can change your relationships with other people, you can change your future by changing what you tell yourself. But first, 
the first thing you have to do is become aware of what you're telling yourself. You have to get conscious, become conscious, consciously aware of your inner conversation. You have to get involved. You have to start talking to yourself on purpose instead of by accident. When you start talking to yourself on purpose, then you get involved in your inner conversation. But I do want to warn you about this. There's a little problem with talking to yourself on purpose. The little problem is this. Do you know how fast you can talk? <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's the same in Dutch as it is in English, but in English, people can pronounce about 350 to 450 words per minute. And because we can pronounce that many words per minute, we also read at that rate. College graduates can read a book at a rate of about 350 to 450 words per minute, and no faster. And college graduates can talk to themselves at a rate of about 350 to 450 words per minute. But all of us, even average people, have a brain that can process concepts at a rate of 3,000 whole concepts per minute. Now, do you know what that means? Whole concepts. One concept can take a hundred words to describe. So, what you do is you get involved in a metaphysical organization and people tell you about affirmations. You know about affirmations? and you read a book about positive thinking. You know what happens when you tell a negative thinker that they should think positively? Well, you know, you think you're doing people a favor because you come along and you tell people, listen, negative thinking will destroy your body, it will destroy your prosperity, it will destroy your future, it will destroy your relationships, it will destroy your health. <laughs> So you come along and you think you're doing people a favor because you tell them, think positively so you won't kill yourself. <laughs> so you think that you're going to take a negative thinker and turn them into a positive thinker. But that isn't what happens. If you tell a negative thinker to think positively, you don't produce a positive thinker. You produce a negative thinker who feels guilty. <laughs> <laughs> So then you learn about affirmations, and affirmations are positive statements that you can make to yourself. Like, for example, for 20 years, no, I take it back, for about uh, 40 to 60 years, you have been telling yourself that you're ugly, unattractive, and that your teeth should be straighter, and that your cheekbones should be higher, and that you should have more hair, and it should be a different color. Nose? Oh, the nose. Well, <laughs> I, I can't talk about the nose because if I talk about the nose, I have to talk about the breasts and the penis. <laughs> because people think about those too, unfortunately. <laughs> Because breasts are always either too big or too small. <laughs> and the penis, well, <laughs> it's always too small. <laughs> so we have all these negative thoughts about our appearance. So then we find out about positive affirmations and we start to look in the mirror and say, you are beautiful. You are wonderful. I love you just the way you are. And we are saying that at a rate of about 350 words a minute. And our brain... <laughs> is processing 3,000 concepts a minute. And our brain is saying, no, you're not, no, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> How in the world do we get out of this? I mean, there's 
no way you can catch up to that rate. I mean, you can't talk fast. <laughs> I'll talk your brain. <laughs> and the problem is all these concepts about yourself not being all right. I mean, these thoughts were given to you when you were about this high. Do you know, you know, I hate to tell you this. <coughs> Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> but if I don't, you'll wonder what it was all night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Before you were 12 years old, you were told you can't 70,000 times. For every one time that you were told you can. Isn't that overwhelming? I mean, you asked when you were growing up, can I do this, can I do that? You remember asking, you remember, no, you don't remember that. Okay, you know your children today, how many times today did your child ask, can I do this, can I do this? And what did you answer? If you are an average parent, you answer, no, you can't. 70,000 times for every one time you say, yes, you can. Children even know that, actually. Because, you see, they start with all the things that they know that they can't do. And they ask you, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? And they have one in there that they actually want to do, you know. And they figure if they wear you down, then when they get to the one they really want to do, they'll stick that one in there. <laughs> and then you'll say, oh, well, all right. <laughs> because I'm tired of saying no. Well, the things that you were told about yourself. You see, parents and teachers fall into a little trap. We're concerned about our children. And so we tell them, don't do these things because they're not good for you. Don't do this. Don't do that. You can't do this. It isn't nice to do that. And all these things that we are telling our children are stated in negative terms. And every time we make a statement in negative terms to children, they turn that into self-image. And by the time they're 12 years old, they have already learned, I am not all right. And then, where did you get interested in spiritual growth? There was some time in your life when you realized that you were thinking about yourself, I'm not all right. I've got to do something about it. Is that why you're here tonight? Hmm. You don't have to be honest about this. You don't have to admit it. I know anyway. <laughs> so you don't have to answer anything. We grow up thinking we're not all right and we're going to have to do something about it. I've got to change something about myself to become all right. Now what am I going to do? I mean, I can't out-talk myself. I have this consciousness that is filled with 70,000 no's. 70,000 times you can't. 70,000 times you're not all right. You're not acceptable as you are. You should be better. You should make better grades. You should try harder. You were told all of those things, weren't you? You should try harder. Are there any of, the, of you that were never told you should try harder? <laughs> Anyone that was never told you should make better grades? You see, we're given all these shoulds by our parents. There's a new term for that. You know what it's called? Well, you know, now we don't, it's not our parents anymore. We start giving ourselves. I should do this, I should do that. It's called shooting on yourself. 
And you should know about that. <laughs> how, how do we get past this, this speed at which our mind can work? There is one thing that you can do, and it's something that I would like you to practice because it works. There are words which have mantramic value. Mantramic value means there are certain words or sounds which, if you repeat them a few times, they have an ability to become implanted in your mind, and then they start to repeat themselves. You want an example? Do you ever watch television? You don't have a lot of commercials on television in Holland, do you? You do? Yeah. Okay, well, in the United States, the highest paid people in the United States are people who study mantra. It's true. I mean, a mantra is a really nice Sanskrit term for a sound which you use in meditation. When you repeat this sound called a mantra, it causes a relaxation response. And when you repeat a mantra often enough, it becomes automatic and it starts to go through your mind automatically and it fills your mind with its qualities. That's what a mantra is. Now, there are, cer are certain sounds and words which have mantramic value. That means that when you start certain tunes and you start to sing them in your mind, then pretty soon they start singing themselves. And in fact, you can even get to the point where you want that sound to go away. I mean, you, you're humming a tune and you realize that what you're humming is a beer commercial. <laughs> And you think, I don't want to be running around all day singing a beer commercial in my mind. But try to stop it. It won't go away. So, how do you get rid of it? You have to start another mantramic sound in order to get rid of it. Now, this is the key to getting faster than your brain. The key is this. There are certain words and sounds which have mantramic value. When they are repeated, they start repeating themselves and they start to fill your mind with their sound and their message. Mantramic value means that they have a particular rhythm. When you repeat them, they repeat themselves at a particular rhythm. So particular rhythms, particular notes, and particular progressions of notes have mantramic value. When a word or a sound or a statement has mantramic value, it is called a biha. Biha is the Sanskrit word for seed. When you plant a seed, you don't expect, let's say you plant a, a, a seed of corn. You don't expect one kernel of corn to come up, do you? You expect a thousand kernels of corn for every one you plant. You have to do the same thing with your thoughts. I want a thousand thoughts for every one that I plant. So I use seed thoughts. And I plant them so that they will come out with more than I put in. That's the only way that I can think faster than my mind. Plant biha thoughts. What are they? <clears throat> I'll give you some very simple examples. There are four that I like to use for people because these four cover most of the things that we concern ourselves with. The first one is called I can. I can what? What can you do? You know something, uh, in English it's very common when you are, when you're frustrated, it's very common to say, I just can't handle any more. What, what does that sound like in Dutch? Ik kan niet meer aan. Ik zie het niet meer zitten. Is that very common? Ik zie het niet meer zitten. Yeah. Yeah. People repeat that. I just can't handle anymore. I can't take it anymore. So that I can't, you need to replace that. I can handle it. 
That, in fact, you know, here's the secret of getting your mind to work for you. If you have been thinking that you are unattractive all your life, and all of a sudden you start telling yourself you're beautiful, you have gone from one untruth to what you consider to be another untruth. In order to get your mind to work with you, you're going to have to tell yourself the truth. And that's what works. And the truth is not the opposite of the untruth. That's the first thing to learn about talking to yourself. Don't take what you have been telling yourself. I can't handle it. I can't do it. I am unattractive. I'll, I'll, I'll never learn to do this. What are the things you tell yourself? <clears throat> You're not admitting anything, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never get rid of it. I'll never get rich. Okay, there's a very common one. I'll never get rich. I mean, I may try. This is never going to work for me. All of these things. When you say, I can, what I suggest you do is take a sheet of paper, a long one, or maybe several sheets of paper, and you start at the top and you say, I can. Now, what are all the things that you can do that you want to remind yourself? This is the truth, not what you wish that you could do. Don't put that on the list. That won't work because your mind will cancel it out. You have to be able to believe the sentence. So put down, I can, and then list out beside it the truth. I can handle everything that comes my way in life. Is that the truth? No. You know, as a matter of fact, it is the truth. Here's why. You will handle everything that comes your way in your life. You're going to, so you may as well tell yourself the truth. Yes, I can handle it. Now, there's several ways I can handle it. I can, I can go crazy. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I can become insane, and that means other people have to handle it for me. But that's just another technique for handling it. You see, you can handle it. You can handle it by getting sick, but that's just a technique. You can handle it, and you have many options for how you're going to handle it. So what I would put down is, I can. I can handle it. I can do it. I can do it well. I can do what I need to do when I need to do it. Put down a whole list and make the list long and then go to the next seed thought. The second seed thought is, I will. I can, I will. I will handle it. I will handle it well. I will do what I need to do when I need to do it. All you have to put down is, I can, I will, and then I do is the third one. I do what I need to do. I do handle it, and I do handle it well. I do what I need to do when I need to do it. And go ahead and, and make a full list. What are the things that I am willing to do? And then the fourth one is, I am. And this one is really important. I am all right. I am all right with me. I am love. I am love because I love me. I take my own responsibility for my need for love. Then you come up with four statements. I, I can, I will, I do, I am. Those are four seed thought statements. Now what you need to do with each one of them is make a list of everything that pertains to all the things you can do, all the things you will do, all the things that you do do, and all of the things that you are that are positive. <clears throat> now what happens is you don't have to repeat all of those things that you have written on all those pages. Those thoughts are all already associated with these four statements. I can, I do, I will, I am. Then all you have to do is repeat the four mantra. So repeat them with me a couple of times. I can, I do, I will, I am. I can, I will, I do, 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 I am. Come on. 
<laughs> you guys can do better than that. I mean, it's like a train taking off and building up steam. That's what it's supposed to be like. So let's do it. I can, I will, I do, I am, 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 I can, I will, I do, I am. Now, let me tell you why we're doing that. Because those are just little two word statements. But each one of them is associated with all that you wrote about that statement. So I'm suggesting when you go home, you take I can and you write out page after page what I can do. Now, you don't have to repeat all those pages. All you have to do is say I can and your brain knows the rest. So every time you say I can, then you've got those whole concepts. You know, your brain is capable of processing seven or 3,000 concepts per minute. So you just gave it huge concepts. And every time you pronounce, I can, your brain has to pronounce the whole concept that is associated with I can. And then, I will. And your brain has to produce that whole concept. I can, I will, I do, I am. And if you go as quickly as you can with those four seed thought statements, your mind is required to process everything that you have associated with those four statements. Then you catch up with what your mind is producing as negative that is tearing you down. What I'm going to say, suggest that you do even though these four statements are in English, that's not perhaps your native tongue. You can translate them if you want to, or you can use them in English, it doesn't matter. Take these four statements, write out whole pages of what they mean to you, and then start to pronounce them just as we just did. Start them slowly. I can, I will, I do, I am. And even when you start, Start slow and calm and quiet. I can, I will, I do, I am. And then build it up. I can, I will, I do, I am. I can, I will, I do, I am. And move it on until it's really moving through you. Now what I'm suggesting that you do is do this every day for 30 days. After 30 days, your mind will begin to repeat these without you even having to think about it. As you go to work, as you do your work, as you do things that have nothing to do with repeating these statements, you may be reading a book, watching television, you may be working at a computer, and you'll find your mind is processing these words, I can, I will, I do, I am, I can, I will, I do, I am, I can, I will, I do, I am. And then all of a sudden, you run into something that's a problem, and you say, I just can't handle this. And your mind will say, I can, I will, I do, I am. <laughs> and then you'll know, I got it. I have reprogrammed my consciousness to know, I can handle it, and I will, and I do, and I am all right. You can get involved in your self-talk process. You do talk to yourself. Now what you need to do is talk to yourself on purpose. Know what you're telling yourself. <coughs> know what the result is of what you're telling yourself. You can talk yourself into being healthy if you want to. You can talk yourself into being wealthy if you want to. But you will have to stop believing that it's not nice to want to be wealthy. What is the truth about that? Are we too materialistic when we think, I want to be wealthy? Is that too materialistic? I do think... You're the most non-committal group I've been uh, with all week. You're not going to admit you think there will be not enough for everybody, and hmm? everybody wants to be wealthy. There will not be enough. So, oh, uh, did you hear this? If everybody wants to be wealthy and everybody gets wealthy, there's not enough for everybody. Do you believe that? I want to tell you something. This planet is abundant. 
It is so abundant that there is enough food on this planet right now to feed every man, woman, and child on this planet more than they need to eat today. That's true. Now, at the same time, there are children starving on this planet today. Why? Because people who have the wealth and the food and the money are afraid that if they turn loose of it and feed those who need to be fed, that there won't be enough for them. Fear consciousness is what makes us try to hold things to us, hang on to them, instead of turning loose of them. If you get wise enough to learn the abundant law of release, you will allow yourself to become wealthy. Do you know what is the easiest way to become poor? Try to hang on to what you've got. Mm -hmm. When you hang on to what you've got, the universe can't give you any more. Because you're hanging on, you're clinging on for dear life. And the universe has got all this that it wants to give to you. I mean, we do not live on a needy planet. We live on a prosperous planet. There's enough gold in these mountains for every one of us to have all of the riches that we need for all of our life. There is not a problem with abundance. So it's all right to want to be wealthy. I'll tell you something else. You can't help it. You are a living being. There is a law of life that says every living thing has a natural life impulse. A life impulse means every living thing wants to live more. Every plant, every animal, every human being, it's a principle of life. Life itself wants to live and express more abundantly. You are a conscious being. It is the nature of consciousness to want to expand. So your consciousness wants to expand, you want to live more abundantly, and it is your very nature to have desire. And I know that there are gurus all around the planet who are telling you that desire is not nice. I want to tell you something about those gurus. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that I want you to know about those gurus is that they desire that you should listen to them. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> they desire to own you. If they can call you a disciple, they have you in their back pocket and they can teach you it's not nice to want a lot of money, so what you should do is give it to me, and then you will be very saintly. You see, it's not just gurus that do that. The church does that. And so does the government, and so does the power structure. Do you know that there, all the power elite out there have a vested interest in teaching you that there's something desirable about poverty? They've been teaching you that for at least 2,000 years. And if they can keep you believing that it's nice to be poor, then they can keep you from changing this planet. And that means they can keep you from feeding the hungry of this world because you believe that it is so desirous to be a pauper. I want to be spiritual. So I have to be poor. I'm not supposed to want money. There is a seed thought for that. A special word. You want to know the word for that? Yeah. <clears throat> Bullshit. <laughs> That's the word. There's nothing desirous about being poor. There's nothing wonderful about poverty. People who have abundance can make a difference on this planet. The richest people on this planet should be the most loving people on this planet. And I hope that's you. <clears throat> if you are a loving, caring person, 
If you're a loving, caring person and you had a million dollars, it means that some hungry people around the world would be fed. Listen, I have a problem with the current distribution of wealth on this planet. The people who have the most money are making guns. I would like you to be the wealthy people of this planet. And I'm serious. I am really serious. I would like the loving, caring, spiritual people of this planet who have been taught far too long there's something desirable about being poor. I would like to liberate you from that thought so that you will become the wealthiest people on this planet because I believe that if you do, we will feed the hungry of this planet and we will build the health facilities that will treat the sick of this planet and we will stop putting our money into making guns and lining our houses with nice things and building walls around our countries to keep people out. It's wonderful that the Berlin Wall just came tumbling down. But the Berlin Wall was not any more evil than the wall around the United States that keeps hungry people out. The United States has been self-righteous for years saying the communist world builds walls to keep people in. And that self-righteous country was building walls to keep people out. It's time for the walls to come tumbling down in both the East and the West. And it's time for us to stop storing grain in America that rots and feeds the rats when it could be shipped to India. There is nothing for us to be self-righteous about. There is enough money and enough food in the world to feed everyone in the world. All we have to do is change the distribution system. We have to get the money into the hands of people who care. So it's my mission to tell you there is nothing desirable about poverty. Stop trying to be spiritual by experiencing poverty. And start realizing that money is a sacred instrument. It's the most sacred instrument you can handle because money is nothing more than a symbol of appreciation, a symbol of value, and a symbol of love. You give money to those you love. You give money in exchange for value. It's a symbol of value. What's wrong about that? It's desirous to have money because it can cause things to happen. So the people who ought to have the money are the people who know what ought to happen to the earth. So let's put the, the money in the hands of the spiritual people and let's feed the hungry of the earth. It's time. It's time for us to wake up and not be fooled by the power structure anymore. It's time to break loose of the bonds of doctrine and dogma. It's time to break loose from the bonds of the church and the state and the wealthy. And no, it's all right for us to be the people who control the wealth. So, forgive yourself for being poor. And then allow the money to come to you. And as it comes to you, Start causing a difference in the planet and start talking to yourself on the purpose and know what you're telling yourself. Tell yourself you're beautiful. I can see it. I can believe it. Allow yourself to see the truth about yourself. And if you don't believe you're wonderful, start telling yourself the truth and start believing it. And no, you're prophets. And you have been prophesying all your life. And the things that you prophesied about yourself come true. So now turn it around and start prophesying wonderful things. And start finding out they come true too. Start worrying backwards. Worry yourself to life instead of to death. Worry yourself to wealth instead of to poverty. Let yourself get so worried that things are going to go so well that you just won't know what to do with all of the health and wealth and wonderful relationships of all the people who are attracted to you because you're so attractive 
that people just can't hardly handle. <laughs> Start thinking that way. And then notice that the way you think produces the way you are. And it changes the world around you. You're powerful, creative people. Take responsibility for your power. You'll change yourself and you'll change the world. We are on the brink of a major change on earth today. We've got to tear down the walls. The Berlin Wall was only the beginning. We've got a lot more walls to tear down. And you're going to need power to do that, so don't be afraid of power. You're going to need money to do that, so don't be afraid of money. You're going to have to be attractive to do that. You need charisma so that people will be attracted to you. Don't be afraid of your attractiveness. Don't be afraid of who you are. Don't be afraid to know you are all right, just the way you are. You don't have to change anything to get better. You will never be better than you are. There isn't anything better than you are. You are an incredible, amazing being capable of doing anything that you want to do. So tell yourself the truth about that, because it is the truth. Tell yourself the truth, and then get out there and do it. We can change the world. Do you believe that? No. All right, let's try again. Four little no. statements. <laughs> I can, I will, I do, I am, 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 I can, I will, I do, I am. I believe you. Now, from the things that I have brought up tonight about talking to yourself on purpose, I wonder if you have some questions that came up while I was talking that you would like me to explain something further, maybe something that I didn't make clear, or I brought up a point that maybe I didn't complete, or you want some more information about it. So this is your opportunity to be a part of the conversation. Let's talk. Something, something that you hope to do in the future? Never. Never. Never make these statements in the future because the future never arrives. When you say, I will, you are speaking of the application of your will. And your will is your determination. So when you say, I can do this, then you add another thing to it. You say, I can and I will. I can handle it and I will handle it. I can do it, and I will do it, and I will do it well. And it's also very good for procrastination. A lot of people have problems with procrastination. That was one that I had to work on, and that's why I used the term, I will. I put out beside that one, I will do what I need to do when I need to do it. And that meant that I start doing things when they come to my attention and I stop putting them off into the future. So the statement, I will, is a commitment. So you don't put down what you hope to do or what you wish to do or anything in the future, but something that you are making a commitment to right now. I can do it and I will. <coughs> Procrastination. Yes. Okay. Procrastination means putting things off. Uh, things that you should do now, you put them off until later, and so they keep getting pushed back and they don't get done. So I needed to work on that for myself, because my desk would pile up with things that I didn't get done. And I found that when I started saying not only I can do that, I knew I can, but then I started saying I will do that. I will do what I need to do when I need to do it. And as I repeated that to myself, I became aware, when I see that it needs to be done, that's when I need to do it, as soon as I see that it needs to be done. And so my time began to rearrange itself, and I found that there was more time in the day that I thought there was. Mm I like it when I've explained everything so well that everybody understands totally and nobody needs to ask a question. Tomorrow comes the question. About more time in the day, can you explain how you manage that? Okay. You know what I found out? I, 
at the at the fellowship, our office where I work, I find always a lot of very very busy people. I mean. The activity there is so busy that you wouldn't believe it. People have so much to do, and it's so much more than they can do. And then they begin to work with these affirmations. I can, and I will do what I need to do when I need to do it. <clears throat> and people begin to rework their priorities. And what they were doing before is they were looking at a stack of work and dreading it. And so they would put that aside and they would furiously get busy worrying about all they have to do and they never did any of it. And they looked so busy, but they were just busy, busy, busy and things were not getting done. But then when they started taking one thing and do it and get that aside and take another thing and do it, then they found that it was not so overwhelming as they thought. I found the same thing in my life. When I deal with things, instead of worrying about them, and instead of telling myself how busy I am, there's an interesting thing that happens in our culture. People are supposed to be overworked. There's a belief that has grown up around our whole culture that says, if you are an important person, you are overworked. And so people want to be important people. So they make sure that they are overworked. And what happens is they introduce stress into their life, and then they get to say something else, which is also important. People run around saying, I have a stressful job. And then a belief gets formed in our culture. These are how things get built up in our culture. It's now a popular thing to talk about how stressful your job is. If you don't have a stressful job, you're not a very important person. <laughs> so, if you want to feel very important, then you have a stressful job and you have more than you can possibly get done. And when you get to talk about that to people, you talk about how tired you are, how overworked you are, how much mountain of work, and what you're really trying to say is, I am a very important person. <laughs> and that's all it really means. So forget about how important you are and just do what you have to do in this moment now. And you will find that there is time enough in every day to get done what you need to get done that day. And if you don't get it done that day, don't worry about it. <laughs> Because worrying about it will not get it done. It will only make it a more painful job to do when you have to do it. So take what you can do and do it and enjoy it and then go to the next thing. And the moment that you find you're not enjoying it, put it down. And don't do it at all. And don't tell me, I can't do that. I, I mean, what would happen if everybody in the world did just exactly what they wanted to do? What would happen is we would have a joyous planet with less disease. <laughs> so why not? Why don't we just do what we want to do? You should be doing for a living what you like to do. And if you're not, you're not making a living. You're killing yourself, and there's a difference. You write down the things you really believe you can, isn't it? Yes. You might stretch your belief just a little bit to realize that you can do more than you have done. Mm -hmm. But don't stretch your belief so much that you write down something that you don't believe. If you don't believe it, there is no point in repeating, I can do it, I can do it. If you don't believe it, it won't work. So absolutely write down the things that you can do and write down what you will do. So that's the same thing. It or might be, it might be the same thing and it might be different. Um, it might be that 
I will do things that I have not done in the past. But when I say I will do it, I don't mean in the future. I mean I am making a commitment right now to do this in a new way. I am applying my will, and my will is a powerful force. So I can is one thing. I will is quite another thing. I can do it, and I will do it. So one is the recognition of the ability. The other is the recognition of the willingness to do what I have the ability to do. And then the third thing is stating, I do do what's good for me. I am doing now what I can do and what I will do. And then what I am is all right. I am all right with me. That's probably the most important statement of all. If I am all right, then my need is taken care of. Now I can give you my attention. But if I'm not all right, then I have to spend time on me, and I don't have time for you. So when I decide I am all right as I am, then I can drop my selfishness and get on with applying my attention, my caring, my love, my energy to other people. When that happens, when everybody in the world becomes all right, acceptable to themselves, then we will begin to love one another unconditionally. When that happens, the world will change. Yeah, one of the things to do in, in working with your self-talk is when you notice what you're saying to yourself, make a note of it. If you ever call yourself stupid or clumsy or lazy or any of those things, all you have to do is ask yourself, is this the truth? It's not the truth that I'm stupid. It is the truth that I have called myself that. It is not the truth that I will ever call myself that again. That's not going to happen. And if I do hear myself saying that to myself, <clears throat> then I'm going to talk to myself and I'm going to say, let's treat me in a loving way because I, love, I deserve love and respect. And calling me names doesn't work. It's not supportive to myself. So I want to change. I want to grow. But I don't want to try to motivate myself to change and grow by applying negative manipulations to myself. You see, we have all grown up believing in guilt and punishment. I mean, the whole world believes in guilt and punishment. The, the belief is, if I feel guilty enough, long enough, it means I won't do it again. And that's not the truth. If I feel guilty enough, long enough, I will be weaker, and I am more likely to do it again. So when I feel guilty, what that means is, I'm intending to do it again, it's just a matter of when. So I can drop my guilt. Guilt doesn't make me better. Punishment doesn't make me better. So I'm, if I'm using guilt and punishment to try to make myself a better person, I need to know that's not working. That's not making me a better person. It's making me a weaker person. So I can stop the guilt and the punishment, and I can start giving myself love. One of the things about saying I love myself is... If I say it often enough, I will finally believe it. And this is a problem that a lot of people have. People say to me, I hear you telling me to love myself, but I don't know how. There is no how. When you love somebody, you don't take lessons in how to do it. You love people because you are drawn to them. You will love yourself when you realize that there is no good reason not to. 
when we don't love ourselves, I, I ask people, what's the problem with loving yourself? Why can't you love yourself? And people say, I know myself too well. I know all the rotten things that I have ever thought and all the terrible things that I have ever done. And it's, I find it very hard to love myself. And then I ask them, what do you believe about all of the other people around you? Do you really believe that all of these people are this nice all the time? I mean, all of you have been nice all evening. <laughs> do you think that I believe that you're this way all the time? <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> I know you. I mean, I only met some of you tonight, but I know some things about you. I know that sometimes you are really wonderful. Sometimes you're really loving, tender, thoughtful, gentle, kind, caring. And sometimes you're mean, nasty, and rotten. Every one of you. I know that. <laughs> and it might be that whether I love you or not depends on when I meet you. If I meet you when you're being mean, nasty, and rotten, then I can say, that's what she's like. But that's not the truth. You are a whole being made up of many different parts. And so what you have to ask yourself is, what is a perfect person? You are. You're a perfect person. How do I know that? I ask myself, what is a perfect child? Is a perfect child one who never gets dirty, one who's never mean, one who never calls people names, one who's never too loud? Is a perfect child one who behaves well all the time, makes wonderful grades, and is always sweet and nice and quiet? That's not a perfect child. That's a neurotic child. <laughs> and the same thing is true of adults. We are a wonderful blend of a lot of things, and what we are is perfect. I am the perfect me, and you are the perfect you. And there is not a more perfect you than you are. And that's perfect. And if I will accept you for what you are, just like you are, then I can love you. And you can love yourself for what you are and who you are. And what it takes is a decision. Decide to love yourself. And then give yourself the love you need because it's your responsibility. You need love. Guess whose responsibility it is to provide for that need. You can try to make it my responsibility, and that's fine. I will love you, but it won't substitute for your love. You need your own love in order to survive and be all right. And until you get it, you will be needy. And needy people are hard to be around. They drain your energy. They're always taking, taking, taking. Fulfill your own need and be loving to you. And then you're a lovely person to be with. Because when your own love need is taken care of, you'll give some attention to me, and I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and because I love me, that's already taken care of. I don't have to think about me while I'm talking to you. You know how many people there are that will be talking to you and what they're really wondering is, what is she thinking about me? And they don't even hear what you're saying because they're wondering what you're thinking about them. Their mind is on them because they're needy. They can't love themselves. And so their attention is always on themselves and they wind up being selfish and even egotistical. And we think they love themselves too much, and the truth is they don't love themselves at all. Provide yourself the love that you need, and then you'll be all right. And when you're all right, then you can start giving your attention to other people, and you'll find that that will make you kind, caring, loving, 
and you will be able to give your attention to other people and people will enjoy being around you. So how do you love yourself? Decide to, because it works. Because it'll make your health better. Because it'll make your income better. Did you know that? <laughs> You'll have more money. That's really true. I don't actually have time to give a whole lecture on that tonight, but there is an album out there that you might want to look at. There's an album called The Way That Is Certain to Prosperity. If you're having a problem with money, get that album and listen to it five times. And I literally mean that. Listen to it five times. And when you have heard the principles that are on that album, then watch what happens in your life because money starts coming to you and you change your relationship with money and it works for you instead of you working for it. And that is a real change in life. Uh, the question he's asking is something that I said this afternoon. Um, I said, love yourself God and others in that order. Love yourself first, and love God, and love others. And love God the way you love yourself, and love others the way you love yourself. Why did I choose that particular order? I learned it from a master. His name was Jesus. He said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy strength and all thy might, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he used the relationship with self as a determining factor for how to love God and others. Now, if you love God the same way you love yourself, and you don't love yourself, then you have a problem with loving God. He said, love God as you love yourself. So if you love God the same way you love yourself and you don't love yourself, then you have a problem with God. And there's another reason why I state it in that order, because people have been taught by religion, I am a sinful, lowly worm, undeserving of God's love. Now, the problem with that is people have believed that so long that they have created a God who can't love them. And so they have a relationship with a God that does not support them, has a condemning relationship with them, and they never feel forgiven or all right. So what I suggest is, if you love yourself and then form a relationship with God, you will form a relationship with a God who loves you. And you will know that you deserve that love. And then it will be a loving relationship. If you form a relationship with a condemning, hateful God that you don't deserve, you will never, you will never be able to give that God to others. I don't want him. I don't want a relationship with God who doesn't believe that I'm worthy of his love. I don't want that God. I lived with that God for 30 years. And I was taught to feel guilty. I was taught to feel unworthy. And when I found out that that God was not supportive, not serving me, I fired him. And I'm glad I did. Because it made a way for a God who is supportive to me. He loves me. And I know it. And that allows me to support myself, my source, and others equally. All three. And if you don't want to put yourself first, that's all right. Put God first. And then put others. And then put yourself. Or put yourself first. And then God. And then others. Or any order you want. But if you can love all three, yourself, God, and others, unconditionally... Don't love them when they're nice and not love them when they're not nice. 
give your love to people because they need it and because you need loved people in your life. It's the way to live. Support yourself, your source, and others, and love equally. And what you will find is that you will have love to give. It will not make you selfish or egotistical, and that's what people are afraid of. People are afraid, if I love myself too much, I will be selfish and egotistical. That's not true. If you love yourself enough, you will be all right. And that doesn't mean better than. I'm not better than you. I'm all right. And now that I'm all right, that's taken care of. I am loved. So now I can give you my attention. I can give God my attention. And I'm all right. I'm not needy. I'm not unworthy. I'm not a sinful, lowly worm, as the church taught. And I also forgive the church. <laughs>